All right, uh, good evening to you all and uh, welcome to our talks program. Um, we have a very um, <laughs> exciting talk this evening um, with one of the, our Norval Foundation friends, Professor Jane Taylor. Um, Jane holds the Andrew W. Mellon Chair of Aesthetic Theory and Material Performance at the Center for Humanities Research at UWC. Um, she works on the puppetry arts and is the director of the Laboratory of Kinetic Objects, which is a performance um, initiative in Cape Town. Um, Kentridge has, uh, Jane has collaborated with a lot of artists in South Africa um, and has also written the play Ubu and the Truth to name just one. Um, and yeah, this evening, Professor Taylor is going to be um, talking kind of guiding us really into um, the monumental exhibition that's going to be opening at uh, Norval Foundation um, on the 2nd of September and that's Art and Omega, um, a retrospective um, of Jackson Klungwani's work. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to what you have to say, Jane. Thank you so much, Vicky. I'm going to share screen. Is that the right process at this stage? Great. Okay, so there we go. We're now sharing. So I pop up on the side of your screen and I'm going to start uh, screening in images any second now. But before I do that, I really do want to express my thanks to the Norval Foundation and to the museum for, you know, I approached them and said, you know, you've got Jackson Longuani coming. That is such an exciting thing to imagine uh, engaging with. So uh, they embraced the, uh, the proposal with a kind of reckless abandon. So here I am. I'm, uh, it's the first time that I'm really thinking in a serious way with uh, a body of material that has had uh, an enormous uh, kind of psychic impact on me, although I've never really engaged with the work in any kind of scholarly way. So my thanks to Vicky Lacone and to uh, Owen Martin, both for embracing the, the initiative. And then also before I start talking, I want to thank Anitra Nettleton, Nessa Leibhammer, Carl Nell and Ricky Burnett, who've been in long conversations with this body of work. And uh, I draw on their competence. Uh, and I will also uh, express my thanks to Jackson Klongwani. So I'm going to start by thinking about that rather enigmatic title of the work. Uh, Alt and Omega. Sorry, there we go. Now we're up and running. Uh, I, it, it struck me to begin by trying to consider what such an enigmatic title calls up in us, because in some ways that formulation is kind of familiar. We probably have resonating inside us the phrase Alpha and Omega which are the first and last letters in the Greek alphabet. And according to the book of Revelations, uh, this is one of the names of Christ. And uh, so it has a, an orthodox Christian resonance, but at the same time, it's not entirely that form formulation. There is something uh, distinctive about this alt and omega. The name does ha is a fragment from the name that Klongwani gave to his own church, and we'll get round to discussing that later. Um, in the background, by the way, there's a, a virtual uh, representation of one of the extraordinary constructions of Klongwani's work um, as it was in situ in one of his site-specific uh, constructions in Limpopo. I suspect also, though, that for the curatorial team, the formulation Alt and Omega also resonates with the idea of the other and Omega, uh, in the sense that here is a figure who is uh, very often represented as a kind of outsider artist, and it's engaging with that idea and taking on that idea with some skepticism, I would imagine, uh, and that's part of the the purpose of my interrogation of the discussion today. It is one of the burdens, obviously, on the Norval Foundation when you're setting up a, a proposition, the beginning and the end, that this is going to be 
the mother and father of all Jackson Hlongwani shows. And I've had a sneak peek downstairs in the museum. I'm actually seated in the museum uh, now and had a, a, a look at one or two of the extraordinary figures as they are being uncrated. And uh, it is a really wondrous thing. The marvelous thing is that the show is going to be up until July of next year. So there'll be plenty of opportunity for people to think with it and to teach with it. So in my talk, I'm going to focus on two specific questions. One is going to be a dialogue between the creative life of an individual, Jackson Longwani, and the historical context in which he lived and practiced his art. So I'm thinking about the dynamism and the tension between Longwani as a, um, a practicing, thinking, material being who's engaging in a world of practice. And I'm going to be thinking about the context in which he had to, uh, and also in a celebratory way, engage with the world in which he lived. So that's the first cluster of questions. So in a way, I suspect that one could easily formulate that as an intersection between history and biography. Those are the two dynamics in the first question I'm looking at. And the second question is to think aloud about the complex interplay within art history, anthropology and philosophy about the status of magic, religion, science and art. And in particular, I'm thinking about that cluster of ideas, magic, religion, science and art in a post-colonial setting. Okay, so then given that my first question was that question about the relationship between biography and history. Klingwani's church, which he founded in 1978, after prolonged dissatisfaction with the ZCC, was where uh, he was ordained a preacher in the ZCC. And in 78, after this kind of anxious relationship, increasingly unhappy relationship uh, with that church, he established his own church. And that makes us apprehend from the start that this is no ordinary individual. In some ways, one, the, the figures that come to mind are characters like a Luther or a St. Paul, who are not going to be constrained by the established laws of a church that is trying to govern them and prune their own sensibility and determine how sh they should live and interpret their being in the world. So there's something fundamentally very radical and uh, driven by a consciousness and a personal uh, conscience about how to be in the world. So that's the kind of individual that one is thinking with when one is imagining Jack Jackson Longwane. He had a, a will to imagine what his world should be and how he should live in it. And that's going to mark all of his kind of creative practice and also how he manifests his being in the material world. So that church that he establishes has a really startling name. Yesu Jelei, one apostle in Zioni, Alt and Omega. So there we get the formulation, Alt and Omega. But that whole conglomeration is the name that he gives to his church. And it is marked by a kind of syncretism, a multilingualism. It's almost as if it's a private language that he is forging uh, a mode of communication inside a universe and a linguistic formulation that is unique to himself. So this idea of a private language is something to think with. The, Wittgenstein, uh, the, the philosopher Wittgenstein and subsequently several philosophers have tried to explore the question of whether such a thing is possible. Can there be, in fact, a notional private language? Isn't language in its purpose and in its very um, mode of existence something that has to be transactional, something that is shared? Um, language precedes us. It exceeds us. It places a stone on our tongue, teaches us rules, shames us when we falter. We are born into the kind of um, constraining brilliance of language as human beings. 
It's going to give us all of the possibilities that we will ever have, but it's also going to put all of the limits that it can upon us. And so there's uh, something interesting to think about the ways in which Klingwani apprehends a kind of multilingualism uh, for the naming of his church, as if it's a very de defining act for him. But he certainly doesn't want to isolate himself. I've had a look at a short sequence of video film, which was made in his um, hilltop city, the New Jerusalem, where he had a number of visitors arriving to come and see his work and see the installations themselves. And it's quite striking because there are a number of visitors there who uh, don't speak a language that is readily available to him. And so he transacts the conversation with his visitors with a constant urging look. He has on his lap a scrapbook and he pages through the scrapbook and every time there is an icon, a representation that seems to generate a, a passionate idea in him, he stabs at the, the, the scrapbook with his finger and says to those um, auditors who are around him, look, look. So there's something in the pictorial representation that itself is being constituted as a language for Klangwani. And I'd like to think about that in a way in relation to his own aesthetic practice. So in that marvelous scrapbook, he's pointing us to images that we know, the iconographies with figures of Eve, of Cain, of God, and of course the devil. And he's trying to get us to ap apprehend the seriousness and the significance of these images with this insistent look, look, He is in part, even though there is this transgressive, um, defiant for, uh, formation in him, he is very much part of his Songa inheritance. He was given his grandfather's name, Bandi Pavalala, uh, as a sign that his grandfather had been reborn through him. So the place of the ancestors is something very significant in uh, Songa tradition. However, he later on commented that, and I quote him here, on graduating from manhood school, I named myself Mbazima. This name distinguishes me as a matured young man from the uninitiated. So that act of self-naming one can think of in relation to the, the gestural private language that I've been suggesting is in play in the name of the church. It says, suggests a very strong will to selfhood. He stands his ground against authority. And this in spite of the powerful ancestor worship in Songa cultural practice. And so I'm going to try and work through Klingwani's own method by communicating what he is saying to us through this imperative, look, look. So this is, uh, uh, this, in fact, the installation uh, that's uh, behind me here. It's his um, altar for Christ. And it's, as you can see, a, a meant to be a very potent place inside the hills of Limpopo. The Limpopo region has a number of these circular Iron Age uh, buildings. And it is in the remnants of these buildings that uh, Hlongwani has uh, constructed his uh, or constructed his new Jerusalem. And here in this uh, altar to Christ, we're going to get some very special insight into the kind of aesthetic practice and the kind of sensibility we're engaging with. Because here, in that very altar to Christ, which seems a sublimely sacred space, is his Christ playing football. So there's something so marvelously transgressive about that idea that at the heart of his kind of um, celebration of the Christian mystery, there is the figure of Christ as footballer. Uh, Christ here has this very beautiful rippling hair, such as one might understand from a classic iconography of the sort of Semitic figure from within the tradition. 
But it's interesting to think about why this figure is at the center of that space. The footballer one understands is a kind of secular saint. There is something supernatural about the great footballers. One understands in Limpopo in particular, that there was a very famous Tsonga soccer player, Brian Boloi, who had a kind of a legendary status. So that is a man that is a superman. And one also understands inside the constraints of a Limpopo economy of a young Tsonga man, that the profligacy, the sense of economic um, surfeit, the surplus of being inside the soccer economy must have conjured up the idea of a kind of sublime figure. Um, but at the same time, there is something deeply scriptural about the image of Christ as a soccer player because this is God made man. So if you want an emblem of a man who is a very special man, but who is also essentially human, this is the kind of figure that someone with a massive imagination might conjure. And this is the face of that Christ, the football player. So I'm going to take you back again to see that's the, the image in the whole. And here, if one were just looking at that portrait of Christ, one could, could very easily think that one is looking at a medieval carving in one of the great cathedrals of Europe. It's an expression of compassion, tenderness, forgiveness, and regard, very much inside a kind of a traditional iconography. So there is uh, no way in which one can take offense at this motif of Christ as a football player. I'm going to return us here to that altar for Christ, and you can see in the background the kind of silhouetted figure of that soccer player on the left-hand side of the conjunction of figures in the center of the altar. And that's the figure that we've now just come to know and in some way understand. There's another marvelous image that resonates with that formulation uh, is, this is his sculpture, Champion Man. And it's almost impossible to imagine that this champion man is anything other than a so soccer player. The kind of open gate and this flinging of the arms in this sublime embrace of a, a widespread audience as he celebrates himself in an acclamation of his total humanity. So these are meditations that are inside the kind of soul of Jackson Hlongwani. So given this sense of the compounding of a figure of humanity and tenderness, and sublimity, I want us now to think about the context in which an artist constructs a body of work that is going to defy the limitations on, and constraints that history has tried to impose on him. I'm going to start thinking about the context of his birth. So Klangwani was born in 1923, South Africa. I've put the image up because I want us to have an idea of that as a, as a substantial thing, as a factor in the life of a young black man from the Limpopo region. When I looked at Wikipedia to see what it might hold in its mind about 1923 South Africa, it was pretty startling to discover what is there. King George V is our monarch. Prince Arthur, his son, is our governor general, and Jan Smuts, the prime minister. This is another country indeed. It is almost impossible to apprehend that this was the world into which Jackson Longwani was born. There are only two events listed for 1923 in South Africa in Wikipedia. One, the establishing of ESCOM. The second is that the South African Native National Congress, the SANNC, was renamed the ANC. I imagine at the time that it seemed as if both would last forever. <laughs> 
So why am I mentioning these ideas? Why am I drawing these things together? Uh, it's not just to confound you with uh, contradictory detail. It's to try and imagine what modernity might have meant in the, the region of the Limpopo and modernity in, in its unevenness across the regions of South Africa. And as part of that inquiry, Klongwani constructs this telephone pole. Is this a gesture of how to communicate with another realm? The magical properties of the telegraph uh, were notorious at the end of the 19th century when Edison first patented the telegraph and all sorts of expectation of unnatural event precipitated themselves in the, the global public imagination. Here was a voice being transmitted across time and space with apparently no limit and no natural constraint. Uh, so it pr prompted you know, tremendous outcries of unnatural forces. And in fact, the invention of uh, electromagnetism earlier that century had also precipitated uh, the flowering of the spiritualist movement with popular entertainments like the seance, seizing the imagination of Americans and Europeans when they first confronted them. People began to speak to the dead. And it's a curious thing that these enthusiasms captured the imagination of any number of people who thought of themselves as scientists and rationalists. Alfred Russell Wallace, who was Darwin's uh, combative partner, uh, rival uh, for the moment of discovering the theory of evolution, was himself a passionate spiritualist. So was Professor Oliver Lodge, the man who identified electromagnetic radiation in the 1890s. So now let's try and imagine the Limpopo, a place in which there is no electric lighting, there's almost no uh, advanced communication, and here is Jackson Klangwani situating himself on a threshold between the traditional and the modern, inventing his own church, giving himself his own name, and constructing his own telegraph pole. Also in 1923, there was a significant piece of legislation introduced, the Native Urban Areas Act, that defined black South Africans as temporary sojourners in the cities, which were designated white. Black South Africans could have access to the cities insofar as they were of service there. So this is the kind of conjunction of forces that I want us to think with when we think about the Limpopo. In 1926, when Tlongwani was a three-year-old boy, much of the land that had traditionally belonged to the Tsonga was agglomerated with Venda and incorporated into the Kruger National Park. Large swathes of the area had been inhabited for hundreds of years. And in its policy of modernization and trying to conceptualize what the conservation project might mean in the area, households that had been occupied for hundreds of years were burned to the ground and people relocated, driven out, displaced. About 15 years ago, I was walking with a local game ranger and a companion in Kruger National Park and he was taking us on a tour of vast burial mounds in amongst the, the woods inside the northern reaches of the Kruger National Park. And these burial mounds were the mounds of cattle that had been slaughtered when the, the authorities of the Kruger National Park decided that domestic livestock were not appropriate or seemly inside a place yeah, that was- I'm just trying to figure out how I get the- sound up on this. It's a... Imagined how to be wild. Um, so, uh, sorry, um, we're having a, 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 a problem with sound. Do you want me to just carry on? Okay. So, uh, um, my sense is of the a region of tremendous complexity and 
um, contradiction and energetic dispute about who owned the land, what wild meant and what modernity meant. And this is something with which Klangwani is going to be uh, engaging passionately. And his telegraph pole is one of the emblems of that kind of engagement. There's also another marvelous image. I'm afraid this is a very poor shot because we didn't actually have a photographic representation of this readily available. So I took a screenshot from a tiny thumbnail photograph. This is Kane's aeroplane. The mining industry, as one can imagine, had radically modernized the South African uh, economy, stitching it into the global economic arena. And um, in 1934, the South African Airways was invented when Klungwani was an 11 year old boy. And so it's rather wonderful to think of him perhaps seeing the trail of uh, airplane vapor across the sky or hearing reports of people coming back who've had access to a plane, seen or heard an airplane. So he constructs his own um, airplane, which he gives to Kane. Now, this airplane is constructed largely on the principle of the um, dugout canoes that uh, are, are known in the northern reaches of Southern Africa. Um, Southern Africa. And uh, rather marvelously, this seems to have been uh, its functions seem to have been described to Klangwani because as you can see, the holes, the, the cubicles, which are uh, figured here, seem to have various different purposes. The one at the fore end of the aircraft has a kind of corridor to, attached to it. So, so this seems to be as if he's figuring something based upon a description of someone's experience of an, an aircraft. And one remembers that the art historical tradition is full of marvelous uh, representations, sculptures and drawings of elephants, lions, rhinoceroses of a remarkable kind because they've arisen from the imagination and descript uh, descriptive gesture of uh, some um, visitor. This image of uh, Cain, of course, uh, just to bring us back to uh, thinking about Cain, Cain was the one who had uh, killed his brother, the son of Adam and Eve, who had killed his brother Abel, and as a punishment was sent off as a wanderer. So that sense of someone dislocated is inside the character of Cain until he found a place, uh, a city where, where he established himself in the land of Nod. And if one is thinking about aircraft in Southern Africa, one has to, I think, think with Tito Zungu, just to remind us of these marvelous images that Tito Zungu made of, in colored pencil of aircraft that he drew on envelopes and a wonderful kind of syncretism here of various different modes of modernity and the wry irony of whose portrait is on that stamp in the background. So then Shungwani's life is mapped onto a radically changing world. Traditional Tsonga, as a child, he raised the family livestock and spent his blissful days observing nature, awakening his eye to the world outside uh, and around him. Then as a young man, he traveled to Johannesburg for work. He worked in an asbestos mine and in a tea and coffee importer. He had an industrial accident where he lost a finger and thereafter returned to the Limpopo. At this stage of his life, he was tormented by leg ulcers and he tried to treat them by cauterizing the wound with a red hot iron rod. Uh, these were bitter and miserable years for him and he contemplated suicide. And then in 1978, he had a transfiguring uh, vision where Christ visited him and healed the leg. That healing though was only transitory, but nonetheless, this so electrified and animated him that he established his own church and began the construction of his visionary city. 
So if one is thinking about this diseased leg, it is rather marvelous to come across his image of the leg of God. So uh, one cannot help but impute the idea of Klongwani's own ulcerated leg uh, and think about this, the depth of affinity, the def depth of projective identification that he and God uh, hold inside his imagination. But this image of God's leg with ulcers and the idea of Klongwani trying to heal himself with his burning hot rod reminded me of a painting from the Italian Renaissance because of that coincidence of factors. It's a rather marvelous work by one of uh, Italy's celebrated Renaissance artists, Fra Angelico. This is, it's a small painting, um, not much bigger than a, a magazine, uh, which hangs on the wall of the Museo, Museo Duomo in Florence. The work was commissioned by the Duke of Florence, the remarkable Cosimo Medici. The scene is enigmatic. It's hard to imagine quite what is going on here. Is, this, is there an erotic overtone? You know, what exactly is the substance of the scene that we are witnessing here? It derives from a legend in a book of fables called the, the, um, the Golden, Golden Legends by uh, a writer, Voragine, who puts together a kind of reader's companion um, based on all of the, the legends uh, circulating at the time uh, in Renaissance Italy. And it, it will, in fact, he was in the 13th century, so it's medieval Italy. And this book was reputed to be almost as popular as the Bible in Europe at the time. So what exactly is the scene? There was in the fable, a verger who was desperately ill with a cancerous leg. And he was uh, staggering with agony and in a kind of um, fevered condition. And he took himself to bed and in his dream, in bed that night, in this desperate uh, circumstance, he was visited by two saints, Damien and Cosmos. Damien and Cosmos had been executed in the fourth century, um, and they were renowned as very pious healers. They had a particular kind of um, healing ministry, which they administered to the community around them without any charge. And these healers from the fourth century visited the verger and what they did to resolve his dis distress was they recalled that there was a moor recently dead in the graveyard outside the verger's house. And they went to the graveyard and took one of the moor's legs and came to the verger in his distress in bed amputated his leg and attached the leg of the moor. Uh, and there, there are a number of different images, uh, different artists have tried to interpret this scene. And in some of them you see the moor in the graveyard outside with only one leg and so on. So it's a, quite a wild and um, intensive set of meditations. There must be half a dozen or eight paintings and uh, it's generally referred to as the healing of Justinian. The verger was Justinian. One can try and speculate what exactly might be behind, uh, might, might be behind this um, scene of miraculous intervention and this conjoined figure of the, the black leg uh, attached to the suffering white man, whether this has anything to do with the ongoing wars of conquest, um, whether this has anything to do with a wish for a, des a desired reconciliation um, between various uh, fragmented regions in Europe, uh, it's hard to understand. Or perhaps um, the idea that the, the verger himself, seeing his own necrotic and diseased leg turn black, thought that this must have come from an elsewhere. There are a number of ways of thinking about that. But what is significant about the story is that the work of art was commissioned in its specificity by Cosimo Medici.
Cosimo had been named after the one brother, Cosmas, and he was uh, a twin, and his twin brother, Damon, had died in infancy. So these two souls, um, Cosmas and Damon, are mimetic in a way of Cosmos's relationship with his brother. Cosimo's surname, Medici, reminds us that the Medici family were originally medical people before they were bankers. So there's something quite striking that in this moment in which the Medicis are rising to ascendancy in Florence, they are commissioning works celebrating the healing practice. Um, so interesting to think about what might be happening uh, inside the medical field that art history is alerting us to here. And so I'm going to have a short diversion into that domain of art history and medical practice, just to, to remind us of one or two landmark figures. The first of which is um, Vesalius, one of the great anatomists uh, of Europe, he uh, constructed a remarkable book, De Humani Corpori, uh, so Corpori Fab Fabrica, in which he made images of the human body flayed of its skin so that you could see the working arteries, the veins, the muscles, and the skeletal structure. And this is him standing, standing proudly beside an arm that he has, has flayed for illustrative purposes. And another really remarkable painting, this one by Rembrandt in the 17th century, a painting of Dr. Tulp, himself also a very celebrated and famous anatomist who used to give public lectures in which he would peel back the skin of the human body and explain to the, uh, the dignitaries of Amsterdam exactly how the body worked. Dr. Tulp was one of the most celebrated and wealthiest citizens of Amsterdam and his reputation uh, quite clearly from his status as a medical man. It's interesting just to bear in mind that Dr. Tulp's name was taken from the emblem of Amsterdam. That was not his original name. He too, as a medical man, had invented a name for himself, calling himself after the name of the flower of Amsterdam. So what we're getting here is a sense of that entanglement between art history, magic, medical practice, and uh, a kind of an emergent science. And it's quite striking to be thinking about this set of questions about the status of the, the work of art and the magical interventions of um, the medical practitioner uh, in a time of catastrophic uh, global pandemic. So that's part of what I want us to, to be aware of here. And I want to think also particularly about those extraordinary ways in which the human mind seems to have evolved a particular capacity for healing itself through delusion. Uh, and I'm referring here particularly to something that is referred to as the placebo effect. I suspect those of you who are listening all know what a placebo is, that you can give someone a sugar pill and they will uh, respond as uh, animatedly and as energetically as if you had given them a, a pharmaceutical um, intervention. And it seems as if we have been neurologically and biologically formed so that conviction and belief have effects within the body. Um, and it's uh, been demonstrated that the administering of a sugar pill with no pharmaceutical impact, uh, no pharmaceutical com content does in fact have a real impact on healing. Uh, I don't mean to dismiss the achievements of medical science, particularly in an era of global pandemic. I read a good counter argument in a recent sociology journal in which they observe that somehow an antibiotic will heal someone who does not know they have been given one or who does not believe in antibiotics. So that's a kind of a counter to the speculations there about magical thinking. 
Okay, so now in this last section of the talk, I want to turn to Flangwani's own artistic transitions to, through looking at his personal idioms of expressive figure, figuration. And here we see something of the pleasure of someone exploring his own art form. And I'm going to go from one of the earliest images uh, that's going to be on exhibition, and that's his butterfly from the 1960s. It's a very minimal and clean design, but it's unclear what this hybrid might be because it may just as well be uh, an angel as anything from nature. So even in this early work in the 60s, when Hlongwani is figuring his world, those images also have a kind of a sy symbolic capacity and density. Here is his tree of life, also known as a Jerusalem jug. The, the tree is a potent symbol of regeneration and renewal and is integral to civic life uh, in the Limpopo region. And the tree of life is also an emblem of uh, a, a major narrative and figuration from within biblical tradition. So again, here you've got somebody who is thinking simultaneously about a natural and observed world and an acquired metaphorics of his uh, symbolizing practices. This is Jonah's fish. The natural form with which Klongwani's work, uh, work is most readily associated is the fish. And there are going to be several rather extraordinary and unique interpret uh, interpretations of these creatures. And they always seem to be filled with a kind of lively bliss. In some ways, this figure in also evokes an aircraft, an aircraft for me. So uh, I think in some ways, this too is resonant with those jets that streak across the sky um, above his head, as well as those that streak through the waters uh, in the Limpopo River uh, as he's uh, watching as a young boy. The fish is a potent symbol in biblical tradition. Christ is a fisherman. He manages to feed thousands with a handful of loaves and fishes. And surely the fish as a source of protein must have been a vital factor in the, the area of scarcity in the Limpopo. Sometimes the animal is also constructed into a utilitarian vessel. This is a rather marvelous goat bowl. It has all of the singularity of the character of the goat in that expressive face, but it's been worked into a highly ornate and wrought form uh, for a utilitarian or perhaps even a ritual object in the bowl. Here are two figures from his altar for God, Shangan warriors. And uh, it's striking to think of these figures also being part of the cosmology of this extraordinarily rich and complex cosmology that Longwani has constructed. Uh, they must have been figures of authority from a kind of childhood imagining. But here is another figure of authority, a contemporary figure of authority. This is parliament. And here you have row upon row of yammering opinion coming from the mouths of, what are they? Apes, parrots? goats, some kind of transformative figure. And they are sitting here in their hierarchy inside the houses of parliament, trying to impress their opinions on the world. So then I've saved for the last, the rather extraordinary images from his altar for God. The figure uh, in the middle background with the disc on top of his head is God. It's a remarkable sculpture. The wood that you'll, you'll see when you come to see the exhibition is uh, deeply uh, textured and uh, grainy and uh, full of the kind of uh, the, the elegant beauty of the, the form of the wood itself. 
What one does become aware of in Klingwani's sculptures is that over and over again, it is he is finding the form inside the wood. These fish that seem to be leaping out of the water and the Christ who is playing football. These are figures that are turned because of a turn in the nature of the wood itself or are leaping because that is the kind of energy in the, the fragment of wood, the limb that he ha has worked. So very often there's very minimal reworking of the form in a celebration of the original uh, wood structure itself rather than that which he's imposing on it. These are all various visions of that extraordinary altar for God. So it becomes quite a difficult thing to imagine how you recreate that sense of the potency, the presence of these trees, the situatedness of the rock, the being inside an antiquity into a reaching for modernity that is marked by the new Jerusalem. And so uh, it's going to be quite a challenge and very provocative and interesting to watch uh, the Norval Museum's curators trying to bring into a contained space that sense of the uncontained, which the original installation has uh, in its bearing. This image is one of the attempts to recreate a scene of one of the altars, uh, and one can see how much that work is diminished by its context inside an institutional space. And so uh, I'm you know, going to challenge and enjoin us all to think with the Norval as they try to apprehend something of uh, Klingwani's enormous gesture. I've got a, uh, an image of uh, Jackson, uh, and I was provoked to share this with you because of a, an observation by Carol Nell, who thought that there's something very distinctive about this kind of self-styling of Klongwani as a kind of a Rasta figure. He is not in a traditional sense a Rastafarian, but is there a way in which he is thinking with and looking to the Ethiopian church? Is this part of the kind of for formation of a selfhood that is looking to an ancient Coptic church that had its origins in Africa? This seems to be perhaps part of the, the styling of um, the man himself. Carl Nell has dedicated this exhibition to the memory of the late Okwe Nwizo, who died all too young in 2019. Nwizo was a tremendously significant Nigerian curator whose collection, The Short Century, discusses the complexity of African modernity. And such interventions help us to think about historical shifts through the work done within the realm of the aesthetic. I have a couple of very quick last images to show you because I saw them today for the first time because they've been uncrated in the spaces downstairs here and I fell in love with the figure. And so I want to use this figure once again to uh, celebrate Shlongwani's originality of um, imagination, eye and hand, and also to compel you to feel you have to come and see the show. Oh, no, for some reason they've not uh, arisen here. I'll, I'll try and track them down. And they're, they're figures of the angel Gabriel and somehow they've been lost in translation. So uh, all I can do at this point is urge you to come and have a look at the show and to think with uh, Flangwani's massive imagination about what we believe and how we take to be true as something that arises inside us in a dialogue with that which is outside of us. Thanks very much, everyone. So uh, I'm happy to open uh, this up for conversation if anybody would like to engage in discussion. Um, I think if anyone has any questions, um, we can do um, 
questions for about 10 minutes and you're welcome to send them to the chat for Jane. Jane's you know, not in any way sure that she'll be able to respond to them, uh, but you know, I'm very happy to be involved in a conversation. Jane, hello. I'm not Hi. Sure could... It's busy here. Very good. How nice to hear you. Yeah, thanks. That was a lovely talk and very informative. And uh, something just struck me. Look, struck me looking at the the, the, the the extraordinary images of the the amazing sculptures of Jackson, which I hadn't really thought about before. And I'm wondering if he might have been uh, come across as something. And that that's a similarity to Br Brancusi's sculptures. So, you know, I think this is a very interesting and provocative question because one is, uh, there is a tradition which excludes Klangwani from a kind of uh, a tradition of insiderness. You know, he's yeah. always represented as someone who didn't have a classical artistic education. He didn't come through a particular aesthetic school, but there is no question in my mind when you see him going through the scrapbook, there are images there from Blake, there are images from Goya. He is someone who has a compulsion to look at things. And I would be very surprised had he not seen uh, Brancusi's work. So I think that in all likelihood, you know, he is genuinely syncretic in this sense and that the figures would find themselves in the wood. He would find a piece of wood and a figure would present itself to him. And obviously this is part of a, his kind of visionary practice where he is more releasing forms from the their tradition, natural- In the, tradition, in the yeah. tradition of Michelangelo releasing David from the marble. Exactly so. But you know, I, I would say that he uh, would be very informed about aesthetic practice. And he did in the, uh, in, in the last decades of his life get the opportunity to travel overseas and so I, I suspect that uh, this is a, a much more hybridized uh, aesthetic practice than we imagine uh, somebody who is excluded inside a kind of traditional endeavor. I think it's fascinating because really one is, one is having to open one's mind. I think because of the apartheid situation, because of his, his, his financial uh, situation, his isolation from the Western world, inverted commas, one underestimates the, the extent to which uh, people like himself, Nelson Makuba, uh, had contact with, with uh, the so-called Western world and the traditions thereof. So it's a very interesting thing. Um, Anitra Nettlet Nettleton has written a rather intriguing paper, and I'm not going to get the formulation of the title quite right, but it's something about the authentic professional. So what's so remarkable about the work is that his immediate access to a metaphysics, to a world of visionary apprehension, to an attention to figural detail. His eye is not diminished by his sense of himself as a professional practitioner. So that there's something rather remarkable about his cap uh, capacity to work across those different dimensions of himself. Him, uh, himself. And I think that's, uh, we, ignore that uh, uh, to his cost, I think, think we- so To our detriment, yeah. Yeah, I, I think we diminish our understanding of how gifted he was, that he was someone who was able to move backwards and forwards between Limpopo and Johannesburg, and then ultimately London and other places like that, and Japan, places where his shows were toured, where he was able to hold on to the kind of, um, immediacy of an event and also to understand how he, he became someone who could insert himself into, into a, a global artistic domain. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions anyone would like to raise? <laughs> 
Um, there's a there's a question in for you in the chat, Jane. I can't access my chat for some reason. Oh, okay, I'll just read, read it out to me. Sure. Um, it says, I'm afraid the reading of Jackson Chungwani's work is from a lens of Western aesthetics evident in the comparison to the Italian Renaissance. His reading demands a different lens of African spirituality, keeping in mind that because he references the Bible, it's not the Euro Christianity that's his framework, but an African spirituality that's absorbed some aspects of Christianity, mixed them with existing practices. Um, here, the realms of spirit were understood to be ever present. Most of his sculptures come from visions he saw from other realms. Have you considered these other spiritualities? Thanks. I think that's a, a, a very important consideration, and I don't in any, any way mean to uh, harness uh, Shlangani's work to the Italian tradition. What I'm really interested in exploring there is that there are uh, there's a capacity to uh, believe in the kind of verity of a vision. You know, what's happening in the scene in the Fra Angelica painting is someone who is getting actual healing through a kind of a spiritual intervention. And what I'm, my interest is in showing that the Western tradition had a very uh, deep and strong engagement with metaphysical practice with belief in the supernatural and so on, and that we come out of a tradition, you know, 300 years later, 400 years later, which has lost access to that richness, that sense of a very profound uh, spiritual and metaphysical world. So my comparison, my interest is, is not in saying that Jackson comes from that tradition, rather my interest in, is in showing that religious practices, magical belief, living inside a wor world where the unseen is part of the everyday, that's as rich and lively inside the Renaissance culture, uh, even though it's an entirely different tradition as it is in Africa. So I'm saying that there, there is not one spiritual tradition that, that draws on kind of visionary bliss. I'm saying that one, we, we weaken our ability to understand something inside our human capacity to grasp e events that we cannot explain if we think that these things are only those things which happen in one part of the world or in one particular culture. I think there's, th that's why I'm pointing to the, something like the placebo effect. This is inside the neurology of the human being that this is something that has been hardwired inside us and is part of our kind of survival mechanism. It's part of our healing therapeutics. Does that set of meditations strike any chord? Um, okay, just as a response to that, um, who says we must necessarily use that lens to read Lungwani's work. Ancestors revealed his sculptures to him in a series of visions. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely not denying that. That's, uh, that's, you know, absolutely integral to who he is. But he's also someone who is making telegraph poles and airplanes. He's someone who is navigating an incredibly complex universe. Uh, between that world of uh, revelation and the worlds of uh, economic oppression, of uh, displacement, of uh, hyper-modernization that are happening in other, si uh, other sites that he, he lives in. Uh, and he, part of uh, his brilliance is that the, the visions that he has from his ancestral um, uh, culture and practice are resources for him inside those other contexts in which he is uh, a subject to such oppression. <laughs> 
Um, all right, I think that's um, all we have time for today. Um, thank you so much to everyone who took the time out to um, join the talk. Thank you so much, Jane, for um, yeah, kind of leading us to into the exhibition, so to speak. Um, yeah, it was it was really interesting, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to opening up the exhibitions to all of you. Um, just a, as a reminder, we open again on the second of September. Um, we'll be opening with four new exhibitions, so it'll be Art and Omega um, by Jackson Shungwani, um, and alongside that, we'll be opening Inyanga um, Zonyaka by Ati Patra Ruga. And then you see yourself by Zanella Moholi and the new acquisitions by the Homestead Collection. So we're looking forward to having a busy and vibrant museum again with restrictions. <laughs> um, all right. Good evening and cheers. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you.